Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Edwin Skidmore. I'm the Director of Infrastructure and the lead for the Cloud Native team here at Cybers. So welcome and thank you for joining today's uh, tech preview, uh, tech preview webinar um, uh, of an exciting new service that we're building here in Cybers. So it's an open source uh, platform currently named Kakao, which will most likely change its name uh, in the near future. Um, also, I should mention the platform is alpha grade, thus the tech preview. So today I'll be talking, uh, talking a little bit about the background uh, and the challenges of currently using the cloud, which kind of drove the solution that we're developing and uh, demo, do a very short demo and discuss some of the plans. So as part of the background, let me tell you a little bit about uh, how you know, about Cybers and how it started. Um, Cybers was launched in 2008, primarily to build a cyber infrastructure for researchers. And part of that mission was to connect users to this abstract yet cool infrastructure called the cloud. Um, to put that a little into perspective, here are some of the technologies that uh, were um, launched in 2008. So uh, you can see the WeFit, uh, which my kids used quite a bit. Um, the Android was launched and the iPhone 3G was launched. So during that, uh, during that year research, I would say research in the cloud was almost unheard of, uh, let alone uh, researchers getting access to it. So, um, and if you happen to use the cloud, it was very difficult and expensive and you'd be hard pressed to find any real scientific frameworks that were in common use. Um, so in 2008, when Cybers was launched, the, the life sciences community saw a need uh, for dedicated research infrastructure, cloud infrastructure. And even from the beginning, Cy Cybers were, uh, was one of the pioneers uh, for multi-cloud and federated cloud services. And you can see some of the services that we developed um, around that time. So the data store, which was a federated data storage, the discovery environment, which was a distributed analytical and data management platform, and Atmosphere um, was a, a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud platform um, that was complete with its own application catalog and had sharing capabilities. It was um, hybrid cloud in the sense that it supported, uh, when it was launched, um, it supported Eucalyptus and OpenStack, um, uh, Eucalyptus at the time was a uh, it was an on-premise cloud that eventually faded away, and OpenStack uh, became the predominant on on-premise cloud. Um, uh, Atmosphere is used today uh, and has uh, lived for quite a long time. Uh, it's primarily around it's, uh, it's around primarily because of its uh, usability and its ability for multi-cloud, even for OpenStack. So uh, research uh, today, I think, um, even though the cloud is, um, is a little bit more common practice to use, it has better access. There's certainly some challenges. Um, so, but there's a lot of benefits as well and a lot of more um, um, exposure. So uh, one such example is uh, um, NSF Exceed Jetstream 2. Um, it provides um, OpenStack clouds to uh, researchers and it's a very, um, very easy to use platform. Um, another example is NSF Cloud Bank. Uh, it it uh, was specifically created to onboard researchers to commercial clouds. So along with more common use and easier use of, of clouds, there is now more cloud frameworks that scientists can use and they provide more capabilities in using the cloud. So along with some of these powerful frameworks, um, some of these powerful frameworks are actually complete software stacks themselves that include like web front ends and back ends um, like Jupyter Hub and MLflow. And, but sometimes because they're um, more sophisticated, they are um, often uh, difficult to uh, create or provision in the cloud. So, um, also, um, with these frameworks, uh, science in the cloud has become more sophisticated, um, leading you know, this, to the scientific community uh, needing more, uh, driving some of the needs that they have with data, such as event-driven um, 
being able to analyze event-driven data or uh, streaming data, for example. So Cyverse has both grown in our community size um, uh, and evolved along with these trends and needs from the research community. Uh, as an example, we currently have uh, 98,000 uh, registered users using Cyverse and 11 petabytes of data. So Cyverse today is less about providing our own infrastructure and really about um, connecting users um, uh, to the cloud and focusing on things that really matter, uh, that are more important to users, such as the usability of the clouds, uh, bridging gaps in access, enabling productive use, uh, enabling um, cost containment. And we're really focusing on collaborating with partners to introduce features like machine learning operations, uh, hybrid cloud, and uh, using more cloud native technologies or exposing these to, to researchers um, analyses. So I'm sure everyone on the call can share their own stories about the challenges of using the cloud for their own research. Um, one of the fundamental issues that it still exists today is that cloud is both um, an overloaded term and at the same time very specific. And um, for researchers, if they're not very careful, if they're using a particular cloud, they can uh, risk vendor lock-in. So another characteristic uh, or challenge of uh, doing science in the cloud is that uh, science, is, uh, science in the cloud is very op uh, opportunistic meaning that uh, researchers tend to use clouds they can get access to, uh, either free or low cost access to those cloud resources. So this presents challenges for researchers, um, particularly as they consume their allocations in research clouds, or perhaps they have budgets in commercial clouds. And really this boils down to uh, cost containment or cost awareness. So uh, another challenge is that uh, uh, that researchers have to deal with is that um, oftentimes resources are spread across multiple clouds. You could have storage in one place, compute in another. What if you wanted to do data proximal compute? And then uh, there are um, other challenges if you're needing to deal with multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. What if you want to push uh, compute or perhaps storage to the edge or even on IoT devices? And then um, as I mentioned before, event-driven um, event compute uh, is and being able to deal with streaming data is a challenge um, and then sharing. So uh, whenever you have uh, compute and sharing, uh, compute and data in the, the cloud, how do, you, um, how do you share your results? How do you share the work that you've done? So uh, these are these are open questions. There's not always good solutions that can fit all, uh, all researchers' needs. So um, whenever uh, considering a new cloud technology, it's always a good exercise to consider where on the uh, as a service spectrum it may reside. So I really love this metaphor about pizza as a service. Um, and the general idea is that you know, on one end, you have homemade, so traditional infrastructure. And that requires you to bring, um, bring everything and manage everything versus at different levels uh, of, of cloud uh, that alleviates you more and more of the lower level uh, details. So cacao specifically um, straddles the, uh, the infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, depending if you are a creator of workflows, or someone who ultimately just wants to use Cacao for their analysis. So to better describe what Cacao is and how it fits in research, I'd like to use a metaphor of planning event. So I think most of us are, are familiar with planning small events, rather, you know, whether it's a dinner party or a birthday party, or maybe even a holiday party. So, um, these events have different levels of planning and coordination. And for many of us, planning small events are relatively easy. You could do things, uh, so you usually create an, a list of things that you need to do and execute on them. So examples I put is like, you know, I need to order a cake or order party supplies, reserve a band, things like that. 
And so, um, you know, but, but what happens when the, the event becomes bigger and it needs more coordination? So, you know, now I have to coordinate, uh, you know, I have to coordinate with a band and a caterer and the venue. And then I have like, you know, maybe it's not a dozen people anymore. It's a hundreds of people. So, uh, and then another challenge is, let's say this is an annual event, like a holiday party, and you wanna be able to reproduce this. So that becomes a challenge. Um, well, at some point, if the event gets big enough and there's a lot of things you need to, uh, like someone needs to worry about in terms of the event, well, at some point people hire an event planner. Why? Because an event planner will take care of all the little details for you so you don't have to worry about these things. So details then can be described. Like I want a red velvet cake, a uh, three layer cake. I want, you know, uh, pop and I want, maybe American food, um, or I want, you know, something else. But the, the, the idea is that the event planner can just basically take your description of what you want and then execute on them. And then there are gonna be some details that you don't even have to tell the event planner what to do, and they just take care of that for you. For example, you wouldn't need to tell an event planner, hey, can you order the party supplies? No, they'll take care of that for you. So in a sense, all you have to do is configure the aspects of the party like how many people are going or the type of food. And then you're free to think also about like the bigger picture items, like I want this theme. So a great party planner will keep notes of everything and then allow you to recreate a successful event, maybe for another time. So like think of an annual holiday party, maybe it's a company party or holiday event and uh, you want to recreate it. So uh, maybe you want to change uh, some, the venue of, of where the event's going to take place. Uh, you can change uh, the music as well. But the idea is that the planner will take care of those little changes for you so you don't have to worry about it. And then the nice thing about a good uh, event planner is that, uh, let's say a colleague or a friend wants to reproduce uh, your successful event. They go to you and say, wow, that's amazing. I, I really loved your event. Can I just like borrow your planner? And sure, the, the planner will be able to, to reproduce what uh, they did for you, for your friend or for your colleague. And then all your colleague would have to do is just configure what they want. Maybe they want Mediterranean food instead of American food. So Cyber Scout is that event-driven multi-club uh, party planner as a service, if you will. So they will take, uh, so Cacao will take declarative templates, which represents uh, your analysis or your workflow or the environment that you want to create in the cloud, and then create that for you. So, um, and then it will create it on the cloud that you select. So currently, uh, Kakao uh, is, is supporting very specific research clouds based on OpenStack, like Jetstream 2, which I'll get to in a second. But uh, Kakao already has the code to support other types of cloud platforms like Kubernetes, and it can be deployed to any cloud. So AWS, GCP, Azure, uh, even, uh, even uh, to the edge um, in IoT devices. So the great part of these templates is that it's not just about compute which is a lot of focus for clouds, but these templates can represent storage that you want to provision to, to be used with your compute. And if you want to create these templates, that's great. Uh, that way you can share it with others perhaps or your collaborators. But the idea is like, if you're like most users, you don't want to, you know, maybe you don't want to worry about creating these templates. If you have a collaborator that loves creating these templates, um, you can use theirs. They can use Cacao to create, uh, to import into the system, and then you can just use theirs. Or if some other researcher perhaps published on a template and has one that, uh, that the community can use, you can use theirs. Cyrus, in addition, will be committed to creating commonly requested templates, like creating basic VMs, uh, launching uh, Jupyter Hub, uh, multi-user Jupyter Hub, RStudio, 
even Kubernetes on demand and other virtual clusters uh, will create highly um, uh, high impact, highly requested templates based on community feedback. So what is Cacao really? Um, it's essentially an event-driven multi-cloud service that enables users to scale out and share their tools, their workflows into any research capable cloud using declarative templates. So uh, Cacao itself is event driven. Uh, it's a microservices architecture built on Kubernetes and it uses these cloud native technologies. So I mentioned some of the capabilities already for Cacao, but some of the things I didn't mention that I point out is that it can elastically scale workflows based on demand and also elastically scale down these workflows. It can trigger workflows based on these events. Um, so based on events, and that can include data changes, code changes. It can uh, execute events on some period. So maybe it's like once a day, it could also, receive external sources. So if let's say if you have uh, another queue, like a Kafka queue that streams in data, then it can actually uh, execute these uh, workflows. Um, it can also trigger these things, uh, trigger OpenStack resources as well. So it uses get for uh, the storage of um, for storage, and it supports um, uh, federated identity with uh, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Uh, it has a REST API and a command line client. And in fact, the UI is a very lightweight client that uses the REST API entirely. Um, Cacao will be a key service in cyber ecosystem. So while users can um, execute their declarative templates in multiple clouds, Leveraging the data store will allow you uh, allow those researchers to uh, register uh, for events and activate workflows. Um, users can then use um, uh, the discovery environment as um, uh, to manage and visualize data that gets deposited back into the data store. And also the discovery environment will be integrated with Cacao uh, to, to leverage the uh, Cacao's bring your own cloud um, functionality. So I thought it would be good to spend a little time uh, discussing some of the um, characteristics of templates in Cacao, um, since these are core to the platform. Um, so I mentioned already that uh, templates are stored in Get. Um, it, so it supports being able to pull from branches and subpaths. And in fact, some of the, uh, the templates that Cybers provides um, is there all the templates are in one repo and we just basically pull from the same, you know, same repo, but in different paths. Um, as changes happen to the repo, then the, then the, the, the workflows can uh, use the new updated code um, dynamically. So um, Cacao, uh, so templates in Cacao um, will have metadata associated with them if you want them to be imported. Um, properly into the cow system. So here's a snapshot of um, the template uh, of a basic template that launches a single image. In fact, I'll demo this particular template. Um, the, the part of the roadmap of Cacao is to support CWL. So if not uh, supporting that format directly as part of the metadata, then being able to export in CWL will be one of its goals. Um, so, as I mentioned previously, uh, Cybers will be committed to creating some of these most requested templates or ones that have high value and high impact for a user community. But for technical people, creating a template is very simple. So you can either create it from scratch or use, uh, let's say, if you have an, uh, if you know of another template that's been created, forking it and modifying the template using Git's native forking uh, mechanism is supported. So, uh, and they're relatively easy. So for example, uh, to, to create, so for example, Terraform, uh, a simple ter Terraform template to create a VM is about a couple dozen, uh, dozen lines of code, really. And 80% um, of those lines are gonna be configuration, like setting the name or setting how much, um, how many uh, VMs you wanna create. So, um, and I can show example of that if people are interested um, after the, the demo. 
after the webinar. But um, our hope, though, ultimately, is that you know, because it's really easy to import templates that do um, really amazing things, that the community will import their own templates, perhaps templates that they've already published or ones that are used by uh, within the, their community. So Cacao um, provides services on top. So when you import a template, it validates that template, uh, it tests it and matches that template to the appropriate cloud so that when you go in, to a cloud and you want to uh, launch something, then it uh, only filters on the templates that are appropriate for it. And finally, sharing is a key aspect of Kakao. So, uh, so it sharing can happen at multiple levels. So one is I mentioned at the get level, so being able to fork and modify, but also being able to share within the system access to templates um, and also being able to sh uh, search um, on a template catalog. So I'm gonna do a really quick demo, uh, mostly because it's gonna be a boring demo, um, but uh, keep in mind, so the demo I'm gonna show is for Jetstream 2, which is a US National Science Foundation's cloud for science and engineering. Um, so for other projects that are interested in deploying Cacao, it's easily themable. Uh, it has a minimum install of four to six cores, 32 gigs of RAM. And that's really for a personal deployment or perhaps a very, very small number of users. Um, and yes, you can deploy it for your own use uh, with, you know, with just some configuration settings. But for Jetstream 2, uh, we've also hidden some of the cloud functionality just to make it easier for the Jetstream 2 users to use for now. Um, so in the demo, I'm gonna show, uh, I'm gonna essentially launch a, uh, some resources based on a very simple Terraform template that's single image, you can launch multiple uh, VMs. Now, the reason why it's boring is what you won't see is the fact that there's a template catalog, the template is pulled from get, um, and if there are any changes to the get repo, it updates uh, its template cache to reflect that. So uh, I'll go ahead and So this is, like I said, this is, this is alpha. I'm typing. Sorry, min. So Jetstream 2 uses Globus and XE credentials. And that's what I'm doing. This is OpenID Connect. I should say OAuth 2. Okay, cool. So on the dashboard, you can see that there are um, allocations. Uh, these are allocations on the Jetstream um, cloud and how much is being used. For other clouds, let's say if you're using AWS, uh, users will be able to define things like budgets and see their utilization. And then we will have like the ability to uh, get alerts when but certain budget thresholds are exceeded and perhaps take actions and say not being able to uh, launch additional resources. Um, so right, there's a credential section. Right now, it's not populated with much other than Jetstream 2 credentials. But there, I'll show you a screen which has this, you know, examples of other types of, like if there were multi, multiple clouds, um, what, the, what a credential view would look like. So this is the deployment screen. Um, from here, you can select what clouds, so right now there's only Jetstream 2, but you can imagine there would be AWS and other clouds um, attached to it, uh, to Kakao. Um, and then you can select what project. So this is in um, Jetstream 2, um, uh, in the Jetstream 2 world, a project is uh, your allocation to the cloud and uh, what allocations, like as in CPU hours, you have to spend on, on that particular project. Um, so you can see what deployments are, but to add a deployment, um, basically you click um, add. And here you would see um, the list of templates that are appropriate for that cloud. So in this case, we only have one template, but and I'll show you um, screenshots of other templates that are um, close to completion. This one just simply launches 
uh, a VM, one or more VMs from a single image. Um, so these, uh, so in this screen, I'm setting the parameters for the configuration. Um, um, and in for Jetstream, um, I can select an image and then how many instances and then the size. So these parameters are all taken from the template. And um, at, you know, as users create templates, they can, um, they'll be able to define and parameterize how the interface looks, including like what fields uh, and what data types are appropriate for that field. But in this case, this is what's for the single image launch. And then I can submit. And so that's basically the demo. It's it's launching. Um, let's see. Okay. So um, and that's that's it. It'll take about four minutes to launch those four for uh, instances. Um, we found we haven't done any formal benchmarkings, but what we found is that the because of the way Terraform is, you can increase it to like six or eight, and the time it takes to launch those are pretty, you know, fairly linear. Um, and I think that you know we'll have we're going to do some benchmarks to kind of see where where things um, how that scales um, with respect to instances and how you use different um, aspects of the cloud. So um, some screenshots of the uh, of other. Um, templates that are almost close to completion. So these are these templates are actually been created and tested in, in Terraform that we have. It's just that the UI, the custom UIs for those specific templates haven't been created. Um, so the interface is uh, designed such that if there is a, a, a custom template that is linked to that particular, um, if there's a custom UI glued to that particular template, then it will render that uh, uh, UI. If not, then it'll just provide a generic form based on the field sets defined within the template. Um, so in, in any case, um, so this is a uh, zero to Jupyter Hub uh, template. Um, if you're familiar with Jupyter Hub, it's a multi-user uh, Jupyter Lab installation. So it supports uh, uh, OAuth 2, and you can select what type of authentication. But you can also select the default image uh, that you want to have the users use when they launch their Ju uh, Jupyter uh, Lab notebooks. We have a template already for Kubernetes on demand. You can select how many. Uh, you can select um, how many instances you want. This is using K3s uh, from Rancher, um, but it's re relatively simple to include something else if you want to use Kube Spray to deploy a form over of like a full. Um, Kubernetes version, you can. Um, but this one is using K3s. It's really nice because you can uh, have a Kubernetes cluster of size one, uh, node size one, up to a very large size. Um, in fact, uh, Cacao uses K3s. We've been using K3s in production for a couple of years now, actually, for other, for other services. But this particular tem template, in addition to selecting, you know, the image and how, what size it is, uh, we have it so that you can select what ports are open on the ingress, uh, which is configured for Nginx ingress for now. And then you can just, if you want to deposit um, a resource YAML, you can just pull it from URL or raw text. Now for very simple cases of Kubernetes on demand, this, uh, this, uh, this, seem, this is a very convenient way of, of executing Kubernetes. Um, I we didn't expose uh, the cloud management screen uh, aspects of uh, Cacao in my demo. That's been hidden mostly because Jetstream two users um, are only going to be using Jetstream two for now. But it supports Kubernetes and other public clouds. And then we have uh, a, the a searchable catalog um, for. Uh, um, that's in the works. Okay, so some of the projects uh, that are uh, that we're collaborating with already is Jetstream Two, which is an NSF 
again, an NSF um, cloud for science and engineering. Um, we're also partnering, uh, we're also a partner on hydrogen, which is another NSF project to build. Uh, it's essentially a uh, machine learning uh, simulation platform for the hydrological, uh, the hydrology sciences. And uh, one of um, its goals is to elastically scale to AWS. Um, Coalesce is a essentially a smart farm um, project and uh, its needs is to distribute um, um, computing on the edge. So the, being able to deploy machine learning um, uh, algorithms as on the edge as data is streaming into uh, our central cloud at Cybers. And then finally, um, Ira is developing uh, AI -driven, uh, driven predictive digital twins um, to help with the resiliency of the the national agriculture system. So we're helping develop um, machine learning operations in the cloud. So uh, I mentioned a lot of these benefits before, but just to summarize, um, so the ability for users, you know, the ability to bring their own cloud and then being able to do analysis uh, dy dynamically using their own credentials, uh, and then being able to do uh, to also bring on-prem clouds, um, we we have researchers that use Cybers and they've been wanting to. They have their own uh, hardware, their own nodes, and they even have their own Kubernetes clusters. Let's say, and um, and then being able to bring that in and then push their analyses uh, is something that uh, was that then they've been needing for a while. Um, and then being able to, and this is kind of on the long-term roadmap, being able to share that cloud access, let's say, again, if you, if you have access to an on-prem cloud and being able to share that easily um, is something that uh, would benefit users. Uh, we support federated identity. Uh, we have multiple modes of provisioning. Uh, some of these were already discussed. Um, so on-demand, being able to provision persistent services um, and then being able, really being able to activate and launch uh, workflows based on events. So as let's say data events or streaming data. Uh, and then one of the, the exciting things that I think um, will be of value to users is cost containment. So part of that is the event-driven workflows, only using the resources when they're needing, needed but also helping out with the budgeting. So um, allowing users to set budgets for you know, how much utilization they want to cap things at, and then getting notifications or enforcements, depending on the thresholds. Um, as I mentioned before, it's, uh, it has, uh, Kakao has an API and a CLI um, so that uh, users can programmatically uh, extend their analyses or enhance what they already have, um, and then temp template reuse. So being able to create a template and reuse it over and over again and share that, or perhaps using someone else's. Uh, there's, there's certainly some benefits. There's benefits for infrastructure providers, um, being able to connect your cloud and then use Kakao very easily. Obviously, there might be some you know, asterisk to that. Um, nuances with authentication, authorization, aspects to allocations. Uh, and we would love to, to work with you to help integrate your cloud. Um, but also, uh, inevitably, infrastructure providers have templates of their own that they're interested in to provide their own community. As, as template creators, uh, you know, being able to have a way to um, expose these templates and share them and publish on them is a, a something of benefit for our folks. So as I mentioned, uh, Kakao is still in the alpha stages of development. Um, so, so here are some of the things that uh, high level roadmap items that we have in the near term. Um, so uh, improving the, the performance of deployments uh, and ex particularly exposing um, how Kakao, um, as Kakao is deploying workflows into the cloud. So as you saw when I was, when I clicked the button to deploy that single image, 
uh, it would be what we want to do is show you as it's deploying um, the different um, the different artifacts that are being created. Um, so that will help with uh, triaging if there's problems with your template and whatnot. Um, so uh, while Cacao certainly stands on its own, the real kind of value for Cybers, Cybers as users is integrating with uh, the Cybers platform and really adding value. So it's integrated with the discovery environment and data store um, and our other uh, and our other services. So, um, so I mentioned that um, event-driven uh, workflows is a, a you know a, a core competency of Cacao, and so. Uh, uh, one of the things that we're going to do um, shortly is exposing uh, users being able to trigger those events based on uh, trigger uh, workflows based on those events and provisioning them. So scaling these things out, scaling these workflows out or scaling down when there's no longer events. Um, so we're, we've integrated with uh, Kubernetes um, and uh, Terraform, but also looking at integrating with other templates and template engines, exposing a, a template catalog, um, adding, uh, so because we're integrated with OpenStack as one of our current priorities, uh, we also want to expose some OpenStack specific operations that are not provided through templates alone. For example, instance snapshotting is something that templates don't provide. Uh, and then lastly, uh, another big feature, uh, on the roadmap is being able to import resources that weren't directly created through the templates. So um, right now, Cacao makes the assumption that you know it's going to manage those resources that were created by templates. But what if you create those resources outside? Um, so there are ways, and it really depends on the template engine on how things get imported. But um, uh, and so that will have to be kind of addressed on a template by template. Um, or template engine basis. So, you know, part of the reason we do these tech preview webinars is to receive feedback from the community and receive suggested features. Um, and so, please, if you have any other use cases that you'd like to share, we, um, we're all ears. Um, let us know also if you're you if you have a favorite template language. Um, that would be very impactful for you or your community. Um, and if you're already using things like Terraform or Kubernetes to provision resources, um, suggest templates and we would look into integrating it with um, or importing it into Cacao. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, we use Terraform and OpenStack right now in the near future. The idea is that we'll expose more. Uh, we'll want to look at Terraform AWS. So the Kubernetes and Argo templates are uh, almost done. Uh, and so they'll be provided um, soon. Uh, we're always looking for um, alpha and beta testers. So let us know if you're interested in collaborating or contributing. Um, and lastly, um, if you're interested in helping with development, uh, developing this really cool platform, we'd love to have your participation. Um, one of the reasons I joined Cybers was creating cool technology that would impact science, and I, I really feel this is something that uh, science, uh, scientists and researchers have been asking for for a while. Um, in any case, next step. So when will Cacao be available? It'll be available soon. Um, uh, Cybers as an organization has also been impacted by the staffing shortages. So it has impacted some uh, delays in on how um, the, the, you know, some of the cacao delivery, we had wanted it sooner, but it's just, you know, staffing shortages have been um, hit, impacting us as well. So where will it be available? Uh, Jetstream 2 and who can access? Well, uh, through Jetstream 2, there will be an exceed allocation process. Uh, we'll also be providing cacao um, through Cybers, it'll, it'll expose uh, probably a lot more features than um, as what's provided in Jetstream 2, depending on like how comfortable, uh, well, depending as we uh, develop features. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's it from the webinar. 
Um, here are the, the team that helped make this possible and I can open up for questions. Thanks, Edwin. Uh, there is a question and it was discussed a little on chat, but maybe you'd like to give your own version of the, an answer. Somebody asked, what is Edge Cloud? Oh, Edge Cloud is essentially being able to push compute to devices that are not uh, necessarily um, part of the larger cloud. So in, in, in the Edge, edge Cloud, in the, in the situation or the use case I'm talking about, it's um, being able to push to um, smaller, um, uh, smaller systems that may be kind of in, in the case, the use case I'm thinking about, like in farm sites. So they'll have these little Raspberry Pis or these little nooks. They'll have, an, uh, they'll have a, a mini install of Kubernetes and they wanna be able to um, analyze data as it's streaming in from sensors. So that's an example of the edge. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Edwin? Uh, if not, just, well, please type them into the chat if you do have them. In the meantime, uh, let me tell you that our next webinar next month, Friday, March 25th at 10 uh, a.m. will be Dr. Bonnie LaFleur and her lab will give us a demonstration of a Python pipeline that they've developed for single cell RNA-seq analysis. So uh, it's not a tech preview, it'll be an actual, more like a tutorial. So please join us for that. Again, you can find information on our webinars uh, on our events page on our website. Uh, any other questions? Oh, just lots of compliments. Okay, would you imagine this being used to deploy a coding class computing environment? Yes, I, I, uh, this is actually one of the use cases uh, where um, we felt was, um, you know, that we needed to support. Um, so like, for example, like the Jupyter Hub example, like being able to, um, let's see if I can. Uh, okay, so in this case, um, being able to launch a Jupyter Hub and then, uh, so Jupyter Hub supports many different uh, types of authentication, but one is uh, being able to do default authentication and you can specify the users who want, you want access. Um, you could also do get, you know, GitHub if you, you, you know, everyone wanted to create a GitHub account, but at, you know, in any case, being able to specify, like if you have a, a you know, a notebook image, that you want every user to use, then you can specify it here in the tag. And then when this is done provisioning, you will have a complete Jupyter Hub installation with uh, and the ability to manage it um, as users, as your class wants to use it. So that would be an example. Okay, that's great. Yes. Um, all right, I don't see any other questions? So thank you everyone for attending and thank you Edwin so much for giving us this tech preview.